Section 2.2 .2 is frequency distributions and their graphs. In this section we're going to be looking at quantitative data now, which is why I said get your calculators out because quantitative data is numbers. We're going to look at frequency distributions for quantitative data. We're going to construct histograms. We're going to determine the shape of a distribution from a histogram and then construct frequency polygons and ogives. Objective one is to construct a frequency distribution for quantitative data. Remember when we looked at the categorical data, this class here was just our categories. Well, with quantitative data, we have numerical values that can be measured on some sort of a scale. So to summarize quantitative data, we use a frequency distribution just like those for the qualitative data. However, since these data have no natural categories, we have to come up with our own categories, and we do that by dividing the data into classes. Classes are the intervals of equal width and it's important that we have the classes be equal width that cover all values that are observed in the data set. So the way that we would read this is we would have our class right here. The first number in the class is our lower class limit. The next number would be our upper class limit. Just like with the qualitative data, the frequency is the count or the number of times a data value was between 0 and 4. The next class goes from 5 to 9. Our lower class limit is 5, the upper class limit is 9. We have a frequency of 4 there for this particular data, uh, data set. I don't know what data set they're using, it, but it's different from the one in the last section. The other thing we said is the classes have to have equal width. So how we determine the class width is we look at the difference between consecutive lower class limits or consecutive upper class limits. They all have to be the same. So the difference between 0 and 5 is 5. The difference between 5 and 10 is 5. And between 10 and 15 is 5. Our class width is the same. Another thing that you have to have happen is these numbers have to be different. I couldn't have an interval that goes from 0 to 5 and then from 5 to 10 because if I had a data value that was 5, which class would I put it in? Do you see the problem there? So there will be a bit of a gap here on these class widths. The first thing you need to do is choose your classes. Every observation must fall into one of the classes. So when you have a set of numbers or a set of data, you look and see what is the smallest value and what is the largest value. And then your endpoints on your, on your table have to cover the spread of those numbers. So the classes must not overlap, I've already explained why, and the classes must be of equal width. So once we determine what our starting point is, we can determine what our class width is, and then we just go from there. So you can't have any gaps between the classes. Even if there are no observations in a class, the frequency we would record as zero. And that's okay, it happens sometimes. Here's the five steps we're going to follow for constructing a frequency distribution. In the next example, we're going to actually go through the process and do this. So step one is to choose a class width. Step two is to choose a lower class limit for the first class. This should be either a convenient number that is slightly less than the minimum data value. Then you compute your lower limit for the second class by adding the class width to the lower class limit for the first class. Lower class limit for the second class will be the lower class limit for the first class plus whatever the class width is. So for example, if I had a list of test scores and let's say that the tests were from, I had grades ranging from 57 to 98. One way that I could construct my classes is I could have the test scores go from 50 to 59, 60, to 69, 70 to 79, 80 to 89, 90 to 99. And if I had test scores between 57 and 98, they would all fit in there and I would have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 classes with a class width of 10. And then I just look at my grade book and I would put a tick mark every time a test fell within a certain category and that's how I would calculate my frequencies. Any questions? These class bounds would work then for, for recording tests. If my minimum is 57, it's within this range. And if my maximum is 98, it's still within this range. What if my maximum was 100? 
Could I keep these bounds? I couldn't use these class widths if I had a test score of 100 because it wouldn't fit in this category. So how could I compensate for that? Well, I need this top number here to be 60. And if that's 60, then I want the next one to be 70, 80, 90, and 100. And if I want my class width to be 10, what is my starting point going to have to be down here? And you see how you can adjust that? It's still a good scale. Typically we like even numbers or twos or multiples of five, something like that. Um, some nice number for our class width. And then your starting point, it doesn't have to be your minimum value and your stopping point doesn't have to be your maximum value. But what does has, have to happen is all of the data values have to fall somewhere within here, even if it's not at the end points. Since I wanted my class width to be 10 here, even if the minimum value was 57 and that's closer to 59, I, it still makes sense to start with 50 because that score is in the 50s. So here's where we're going to be introduced to our calculators. Here's our example problem for frequency distributions. We're told the emissions for 65 vehicles in units of grams of particles per gallon of fuel are given. Construct a frequency distribution using a class width of 1. They tell us what our class width is going to be. We don't have any doubt. Looking at this table of numbers, it can get overwhelming pretty quickly, can't it? So what we're going to do is we're going to put this data into a list in our calculator. Then we're going to have the calculator sort the data from lowest to highest. So starting out, we need to first get our calculators. Your calculator may look slightly different depending on if you have a TI-83 or a TI-84. I'll allow you to use either one for this course. But your, your calculator, if you have an 83, is going to have some screens later on in the semester that do things a little bit different than the rest of us. So the first thing we need to do is put the data into our calculator, and we do this by locating the button right here that says STAT. If you will hit that STAT button, you'll see this screen pop up. And then we hit enter and that's where we get our list where we put our data into the lists. Does anybody when you hit stat and enter do y'all have stuff already in the list in your calculator? Do you want to clear out the list in your calculator? To clear out a list we're going to hit the arrow up to highlight the name of the list the L1 or whatever list it is should have black on it then we hit clear and enter. You put the arrow up on the name of the list that you want to clear. You hit clear and then enter and it'll clear out whatever data is in your list. What you don't want to do is hit delete because watch what happens when I hit delete. L1 just went away. It deletes the entire list off of the calculator. Ooh, L2 is gone and it's just gone but we can get it back. To get it back you go back to the home screen by hitting second quit and then we hit stat 5 enter it says it's done you don't know if they're back yet until you go in and look at your lists and boom there they are stat 5 enter is your save I'm gonna write down the steps that you can write on your calculator formula sheet for what I just said from the home screen we hit stat and then enter this takes us to where our lists are located. Anytime I write a button that you hit, I'm going to put a box around it so it looks like a button. If it's a command, I'm going to not put a box around it. This will take you to the place where you can type data into your lists. To clear the data from a list, you'll move the cursor up to the name of the list. So let's say I want to clear the data that's in list 3. I'm going to move the cursor all the way up to the top where the name of the list is highlighted. I'm going to hit clear and it doesn't do anything to the list until you hit enter. And then it clears out the data. But be careful. You don't want to hit this button right here, the button of death, the delete button. Because if you hit delete, it deletes everything in your list. So you go to the home screen and you hit stat 5 enter and it'll bring it back. It's only when the name of the list is highlighted and you hit delete that you have a problem. And the way you go to the home screen is you hit second 
and then mode which is right next to the second button right above mode you'll see the word quit what you're doing is you're quitting that list program and you're going to the home screen and then you're gonna hit stat the number five and then enter and that'll bring your lists back next time you go into the list program so on my calculator I had accidentally deleted list one because now my calculator just has list two three four five and six so if I want to get that list one back I'm gonna hit second mode to go to the home screen I'll clear that out just so we're not looking at it then we hit stat five enter and it says that it's done so I go back in to look at it and I hit stat enter to get back into my list and there's list one it didn't even delete the data that was in the list if you hit delete right here it's gonna delete the entire list but now it's back and I don't want that data so I'm gonna clear it out now what we want to do for this problem is we want to put these 65 numbers into our calculator so I'm going to be typing my numbers into the calculator and in order to put the numbers in you don't want the cursor on the name of the list anymore you want it on that first line is everybody there and then we're just going to put all 65 of these numbers in one list this is one list of data it doesn't go now they they organize it into five different rows because 65 numbers is too long to list on one screen of paper or one computer screen, right? They wrap around. So we'll start typing them in because we're all going to do this. We have 1.5, 0 0.87. Do you all want me to call them out or do you want to just look and do it yourself? The hardest part about this, and this is tedious, I agree, is making sure you don't make a mistake keying something in. And if you are older and you have kids, make them sit down and call the numbers out to you don't trust them to type them into the calculator for you if you have friends have somebody call them out to you as long as you can trust them to call out the right numbers and not mess with you so what do we do once we have our data into this list any idea no clue that's okay because you don't know how to do this I'm telling you now this list program the only thing you ever do on this particular screen is you type data into a list once you have the data typed into a list you go back to the home screen because we do everything from the home screen so how do I get back to the home screen do you remember second quit and I'm gonna add that to our list of handwritten instructions here so give me a second so I was in the process of writing out the steps to tell how to put the data into a list. So from the home screen, you hit Stat Enter. This is what you do if you've got to clear stuff out. And then step two is to put the data in to a list. Let's say type data. So you're going to type your data into a list by typing in the number, and then you hit Enter after each number. Once you have your data into the list, you want to go back to the home screen. And we do that by hitting Second. Uh, not enter, yeah, it's second mode. Thank you. The very first thing that should be on your calculator formula sheet is how to put data into a list because that's how we get the data that we're going to learn how to work with and do things to. This is the very first thing. After a few weeks in this course, you won't need to look at this again because it's going to become second nature because you're going to be doing it so much. But for now, and on this first test, you would probably want this on your calculator formula sheet. Once you have your data into the list, we're going to sort the data. We want this data sorted smallest to largest because that way it's easier to tell what your frequency is for each of the classes. To sort the data from the home screen, we're going to hit stat, and then I forget what number it is. I think it's two. Let me pull my calculator up so we hit stat and then number two is correct we want to sort our data ascending ascending means that it starts small and gets bigger descending means that it starts big and gets small so we want to sort our data ascending now you've got to tell your calculator what list of data do you want to sort because your calculator thinks you may have four or five different lists in there so we're going to put in the list name the way you do that is you hit second and then the number that corresponds to the list. I put my data in list one, so I hit second one. So from the home screen, we hit stat two, 
then put in the name of the list and how you do this is by hitting second and I'm just gonna put one because my data was in list one if you put your data in list three you would hit second three this number right here is just the number that your list is in this number corresponds to the list that you typed your data in this is another skill that you're gonna get really good at really quickly and you won't have to worry about how do you put the list into the calculator hit second and then the number and then you're gonna hit enter so we hit enter and the calculator says I told the calculator sort my data it says okay I did it I don't know it did it until I go in and look at my list so how do I look at my list stat no okay stat one will do it stat enter and now our data is sorted from smallest to largest so our minimum data value is what this is measuring the grams of particles per gallon and what's our maximum value okay we're getting a lot of guesses how you tell is you <laughs> it's the one at the bottom how many thank you all right <clears throat> so we want to construct a frequency distribution that will it has to contain at least every number between these two numbers and we were told that our class width is going to be one and I want to use nice numbers on my classes so how am I going to do that what is the smallest number my class can start with that's what it should start with it has it's going to be a whole number it doesn't have to be but it's going to be now notice also these data are two decimal places I need my numbers in my class widths to contain two decimal places. My class limits must have two decimal places for this example only, not forever, but for this example because my data values have two decimal places. So my frequency distribution, I'll call it a frequency table. Your frequency table has classes and it has frequencies. We said that our class needs to start with 0, 0.00 and then my next class because the class with this one is going to be 1.00 the next one's going to be 2.00 3.00 4.00 tell me when I can stop 6.00 do I have to go to 7 no I don't so if this is my lower class limit what will my upper class limit be it can't be one it's 0.99 it's got to be just under one so what's the next upper class limit 1.99 and then 6.99 Look at your maximum and your minimum data values. Did they fit within these classes? So now we get to the hard part, the frequencies. Only it's not so hard since we sorted our data on the calculator. Because we sorted the data, it's going to be pretty easy to figure out what our frequencies are. So let's go back to our calculator and look at the lists. So going up to the top. 0.25 is the minimum value and then if we go down we stop at 0.94 because that's the the next data value in the list will be in the next class right do you all see this little number in parentheses right here that tells you how far down the list you are so what is the frequency for the class that goes from 0 0.00 to 0.99 9 you see how that works then we scroll down until we get to the next number in the next list and that's going to be 1.88 is the last number that will work within that class right and the number in the data list is 35 but I've already counted nine of them so if I subtract that I get 26 see how that works so now remember we we're looking we've counted 35 numbers so now we go down and see what's going to fall in the range of the twos and that's going to be 46 minus 35 is 11 do you see that I got the 46 from this 
last number that's going to fit in this class is in the 46th position. I've already used 35 of them. If you forget, just add these numbers up. Then we go and count how many are in the threes group. And that's going to be 59 minus how many? 46? 13. Thank you for doing the arithmetic for me. And then we look at the fours. There's only three of them. I don't have to do any arithmetic for that. I can figure that out. So we've got three fours. How many fives? One five and two sixes. So there's our frequency table for that set of data. If we had not sorted that data, this would have been a nightmare, trying to do that by hand. So that's why I wanted to teach you how you can sort your data, and that was a very time-consuming process, and I will be condensing that down on the video so you're not listening to me call out all those numbers. If you were doing research and you got one number wrong, it throws everything off. You got to throw it out. The question was, if you got one number wrong in there, wouldn't it just throw one class off? The answer is no, it would throw two classes off. It would throw the class off that it should have been in and the class that it is in. And what you want to be careful of is after you type your data into the calculator, go back through with your hand on the computer, hitting the down button, and check every single number. I assure you it takes less time to double check your data entry than it does to keep getting it wrong over and over and frustrated more and more. All right, so we made our frequency table. Objective two is to construct a histogram. When you have quantitative data, your bar graph, I said, was a histogram. And on a histogram, these are for quantitative data, and the bars touch. It looks like a bar graph, but the bars are touching. So once we have a frequency distribution or a relative frequency distribution, we can put the information in graphical form by constructing a histogram. A histogram is constructed by drawing a rectangle for each class. The heights of the rectangles are equal to the frequency or the relative frequency, just like the bar graphs, the heights were equal to the frequency or the relative frequency. The widths are equal to the class width. That's why we said that these class widths have to be the same, because whenever you use a bar graph to represent data, the width of the bars have to be the same. So for example, the frequency histogram and relative frequency histograms are given for the particulate emissions. Note that the two histograms have the same shape. The only difference is the scale on the vertical axis. So right quick, we're going to fill in the histogram and the relative frequency histogram here. How do we get this number again? What would I do to get this number? That was 9 divided by 65, 26 divided by 65, so forth and so on. You get how that works? 65 is the total frequencies. Plus, I remembered when we read the problem, they said there were 65 data values. <laughs> but if you didn't know that, you could total up these numbers right here. To do our histogram, we need some sort of a scale. So we're going to start here with 0. And our frequencies are going up to a maximum of 26. So let's increase by 5. So that's going to be 5. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So then we go from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Remember, this has to be the class width. And if you look at the class width, it's going from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. But it maxes out right there at 6.99, which is almost 7. So I put seven numbers on my grid here. So my first class from 0 to 0.99 has a frequency of 9. So I'm going to go from 0 to 1 here with a class width of 9. 9 is just under 10. So you just make a bar. And you can put the number on top if you want. The next class from 1 to 2 has a frequency of 26. So 26 is just over 20, oops, just over 25. And so our bar looks like that. And you can color these in if you want or do something so that you can tell that they're bars. The next class goes from 2 to 3 and that has a class frequency of 11 which is just over 10 and then from 3 to 4 we have a height of 13 
So that's going to be a little bit more than halfway. And then from 4 to 5 we have a height of 3, which is a little bit more than halfway up to that first bar. And then 1, which is a third of that. And then 2. And there's what your frequency distribution looks like. On the relative frequency histogram, the numbers along the bottom are going to stay the same. But now the numbers going up the side are going to be percents or decimals. And I look at my total percents here, my total frequencies. The smallest frequency I have, or the, I'm sorry, the smallest per, uh, proportion I have is 0 0.015. The largest is 0.4. So I need these to go up to 0.4. So if I do 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, that's too big. So I'm going to have to do these in increments of 10. So we're going to call this 10%, 20%. 30%, 40%, 50%. This graph isn't going to look exactly like this one because my scale, it doesn't go all the way up to the top here. It, it actually is going to be a little bit shorter and squattier. But you should see the similarity, the way the heights of these bars relate to each other. So from 0 to 1, I have a frequency of 0.138. And you just have to eyeball this and, and guess to get as close as you can. 0.13 is more than 10%, less than 20%. And we're going to put it, we're going to call it about right here. Because halfway would be 15. So we're going to call this 0.138. Next, we go to 40% for our frequency. That one I can do because it's on a crosshair. This is 0.400. And the only reason I would use three decimal places is because that's what all of the numbers are measured to. From 2 to 3 then, what percent are we looking at? 0.169. So 15 is halfway. 16, almost 17 will be a little bit more. We'll call this 0.169. And then 0.2. 0 0.046. Well, halfway is 5%. 0 0.046 is just under halfway. 0 0.046. 0 0.015 is teeny tiny, and then 0 0.031 is about twice that. And this would be our relative frequency histogram. Notice, even though they're scaled slightly different, these bars have the same basic shape as these bars. It's just that this graph right here was slightly more compressed. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. But that's how you would go through drawing a, a histogram or a relative frequency histogram. When you go into the homework on this section, I think this is the one where I typed in some instructions before you get started. It's in a blue box. And the instructions say that if you get frustrated with trying to graph this, skip that part of the problem and move on. I wanted to put homework questions in there about histograms. But on a four-part question, the last part was construct the histogram. I didn't really want you all to have to do that on the computer in that program. If you get everything else right, it will give you three-quarters of the points correct. In order to get full credit for completing your homework, you only have to make a 70. This does get tedious on the computer program. I did it. I know. And that's why I put in that for you, so that you don't have to make a 100 on the homework to get a 100 for your homework grade. You've just got to get at least a 70. So if drawing the histogram, any charts or anything, is the only thing stopping you from getting a 100, but you've got a grade better than 70, skip it and move on. Basic just read the instructions on the assignment. Don't just hit start without reading some of that stuff on the front screen. Because I, I did the homework before I assigned it just to see if it was doable. I didn't want to tell you all to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. And when I was doing the homework, I was like, eh, this is really not necessary. So if you want to skip it, skip it with my blessing. It's just that their program is tedious. Okay, choosing the number of classes. There's no hard and fast rule for choosing the number of classes that you're going to use. In general, it's a good idea to have more classes rather than fewer, but it's also a good idea to have reasonably large frequencies in some of the classes. There's two principles can, that can guide the choice. Too few classes produce a histogram that's lacking detail. Too many classes produce a histogram with too much detail so that the main features of the data are obstructed. Here's an example where we have too many classes. We've got some classes that have a count of zero because remember on histograms, bars have to touch, right? The only time they don't touch is if you have a frequency of zero. And then it looks like the bar's just missing, but it's not. It's uh, frequency was zero. If you have too few bars, then you just end up seeing a couple of bars and everything else gets lost. 
it's not good to have too few and it's not good to have too many. So it's kind of like the Goldilocks principle here. You want it just right. It takes experience to be able to tell how to do it just right. If I put a question on the test where I told you to construct a frequency table, I would tell you how many classes to use. Or I would tell you a starting point and the class width. And from there you could figure it out. All right, here are the steps that the publisher typed up all fancy and everything to help walk us through how to do a histogram on the TI-84. I'm not going to take the time to read this. I'm just going to show you how to do it. These are in the printed notes. If you want to print them out, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, if you forget it, just go back into Blackboard and look at the printed notes. So let me get my calculator up. We're going to use the data that we already have in our calculator in the list. So let me go back to my home screen. You always want to do everything from the home screen. Start from the home screen. Don't try to graph anything from within a list. That list menu, all you do there is you put data into a list and then you get out. You go back to the home screen so that you can do stuff. All of your graphing stuff is up here at the top of the calculator. So to get to the stat plots, y'all see where it says stat plots right above the y equals? Because it's in blue, I'm going to hit second y equals. Your may be, yours may be in yellow if your second button is yellow. We want to hit enter and you only ever need one plot on at a time so even though they have these available I never use them. But you do need to make sure that every other plot is off. Okay so we're going to just hit enter here then hit enter and if it says off when you hit enter your screen's going to look like this with off highlighted. This is just a toggle. So move the cursor over to on and hit enter and it turns it on but it didn't wasn't a plot thing let me show you see how these say plot one two three four this doesn't have um, four is just all plots off five is all plots on these are your actual graphs you just have three of them so we're going into the first one make sure that you turn the plot on and that none of these others are highlighted if they are you just move your cursor up and it's a toggle switch to turn them on and off or to go switch between plot one and plot two. I want to be on plot one. It's on now and the bar graph is what I want highlighted. To get down to that I move the arrow down and then move my cursor over. Now if your screen shows all six of these graphs in a straight row you're fine. Is there anybody whose screen shows three graphs and then underneath it three more? Do y'all have a TI-83 or is a TI-84? Okay you have the older operating system Right now you're going to be fine. Just scroll over to the right and it should be the like the last one on the top row. If you needed a graph down here, you don't go down to get to those graphs that are below. You go to the right. It's a wrap around. So in the future when we start looking at normality and stuff, you'll need to use just keep going to the right and your cursor will wrap around and drop down to the bottom ones. Because once you hit the down arrow, it's going to take you and after you highlight it you got to hit enter so that it sticks because let's say that I had this first thing highlighted it asked for inf different information down here if I'm doing the histogram I want to have the bars highlighted so now I go down and this X list just wants to, it's asking you in what list is your data if you put your data in list one and list one is there great you're in good shape if you put your data in list three and list one is there you need to change this to list three did everybody put their data in list one does everybody have list one right here? How would I change it if I needed to change it to list two? Second and then two. Not just the number two, you gotta hit the shift button first or the second button first. Leave the frequency alone honestly because I don't know what it does. I've never played with it. And then if you can change the color of your graph and you want to, go for it. Yes sir. Then that means that you're on the wrong graph up here you need to make sure that the bar one is highlighted. Once you get the right type of graph highlighted, the Y will go away. Yeah, you gotta hit enter. You can't just hover. If you wanna change the color of your graph, you're welcome to do it. I'm not going to. Blue is fine with me. Once you do this, then your calculator will find the best window to display your data if you will hit zoom, which is this middle button right here, and nine. Nine is a stat zoom. Zoom 9 and it automatically gives you the, the best window for your data. And it gives you a histogram. Did everybody see that or? Let me see what your calculator did. Can you bring it to me? Do I need a new calculator? No, 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 no. 
When you hit graph, did somebody see something else pop up through their calculator that looks like that looks like the yeah when you when you did your graph and you hit zoom nine and it gives you your graph and you got something where you like you've got another function or something coming through like this did anybody see that all that means is you've got a, a graph in your calculator underneath y equals in my morning class I had that happen so like let's say that I had y equals the square root of x right here and then when I hit graph it's it's graphing the square root of x in there to take that out here because you're going to do it. To take that out, that other function, you just hit y equals and then clear. Hit y equals clear and then hit graph. Guys, if you get a dimension error whenever you're trying to graph, check and make sure you only have one stat plot turned on at a time because it gets confused if you're trying to do both. So I'm just trying to help you anticipate how to troubleshoot some things. That's graphing. That's fun, huh? Moving on. Open-ended classes. It's it's sometimes necessary for the first class to have no lower limit or for the last class to have no upper limit. Such a class is called open-ended. And you've probably seen these before just in your daily life. For example, the following frequency distribution presents the number of deaths in the U.S. due to pneumonia in a recent year for various age groups. Notice that at the bottom our lower last class is 85 and older. That doesn't have the same class width as all these other classes. It's open-ended. When a frequency distribution contains an open-ended class, a histogram cannot be drawn. But you can still look at the numbers. I mean, this this includes not just our octogenarians, but also the centurions and everything. So that class, there's just so few that are 85 and older. Older could be somebody that's 120. Well, we'd have that one data value with a whole bunch of zeros in between if there's nobody else that age. Histograms for discrete data. What we were dealing with there with the particles per million was somewhat continuous, but for discrete data, when data are discrete, we can construct a frequency distribution in which each possible value of the variable forms a class. The following table and histogram presents the results of a hypothetical study in which a thousand adult women were asked how many children they have. Here's the number of children. That's our class. Instead of using a range of values, it's easy to, to let the discrete data be our class. And then here's the frequency. 435 women had no children, 175 had one, so forth and so on. And then here's our large families down here, maybe growing up on a farm or Amish or whatever. Objective three, determine the shape of a distribution from a histogram. Now when we talk about shape, shape is going to become very important to us in the near future especially this shape right here. Do you see how this is kind of symmetric and peaked? That symmetric unimodal shape is something that we call normal. I don't know that your book is going to call it normal yet, but I know that it's coming up and normal distributions are a big deal. So I'm going to start using that word now. But a histogram that's symmetric and unimodal is called normal. Notice this isn't perfectly symmetric. In statistics, it's rare that we have everything just perfect. As long as it's close enough for government work, we'll say, we're going to let it slide. A histogram with a long tail like this one is said to be skewed. And if it starts out high and then goes low, we say that it's skewed right or positively skewed. If the tail's going off to the left, we say that this histogram would be negatively skewed or skewed left. Notice, though, in either of these, for the skewedness to determine if it's left or right, the tail tells the tail. Bunch of alliteration and homonyms going on there, but it makes it easy to remember. If the tail is going off to the right, it's skewed right. If the tail is going off to the left, your graph is skewed left. Your distribution is skewed left. Furthermore, if we have a number line, we have positive numbers to the right, positively skewed to the right, and we have negative numbers to the left, negatively skewed is going to the left. Because I will put a graph on your, your test and ask you, what's the shape? Is it skewed left or skewed right? Is it, is it symmetric and unimodal? Modes are the next thing. A mode is just a peak or a high point of a histogram. So in this graph, we would say that this is unimodal because there's only one peak. But in this distribution, you see that we have two peaks. Yes, I know this one's the highest, but these are both still peaks in the data because if I were to look at this and kind of draw a 
fit a curve over it, it would have a dip and then another peak. In a situation like this, we would call this bimodal. And there's our two modes. This one is unimodal. Una means one, bi means two, if you know your prefixes. It's possible for a distribution to have no mode as well. For example, if I were rolling the dice and keeping track of the numbers that are rolled, if I rolled the dice 10,000 times, I would expect to have about the same number of 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, and 6s. In that situation, there's no mode, and we would call that a uniform distribution. All right, objective four is to construct frequency polygons and ogives. Some graphs use, uh, used for representing frequency or relative frequency distributions require class midpoints. If you've had statistics with me in the past, this book cl calculates class midpoints slightly different than the other books did. This book, in order to get the midpoint, which is just the middle value, it says take consecutive lower class limits and add them up and divide by 2. So here, the class midpoint for this group, I would add the 0 and the 1 together, divide that by 2, and I get 0.5. So the class midpoint would be 1 half. For this one, I would add the 1 and the 2 together, and then divide by 2 to get 1.5. This is different from the book that I used last semester. Last semester, I said add both of the class limits up and divide by 2, in which case this wouldn't be 0.5, it would be 0.495. So this book is slightly different. You add consecutive lower class limits together and divide by 2. This formula you may want to put on your formula sheet. And if you want to abbreviate, just use LCL for lower class limit plus LCL and then divide by 2. I would put next because it was the next lower class limit. So we start with the lower class limit for the class that we want to find the midpoint for and the next lower class limit. Add 0 and 1 together, divide by 2. That's where that 0.5 came from. So if I want to find the class midpoint here, I take the 1 plus the next lower class limit, which is the 2. Add those together, divide by 2. But if your class width is 1, once you get the first one, just add 1 to each one going down. Because remember, if the lower class limits have to have the same distance in between the upper class limits do, the class midpoints have the, have the same class width as well. We're almost done. Bear with me. Although histograms are the most commonly used graphical displays for representing a frequency distribution, there are others. One of these is a frequency polygon. To construct a frequency polygon, we take our grid and we just plot the class midpoints and then play connect the dots with straight line segments. That's it. That's why you need to know how to find the class midpoints. An ogive and cumulative frequency. Another type of graphical representation of frequency distributions is called an ogive. Ogives plot values known as cumulative frequencies. The cumulative frequency of a class is the sum of the frequencies of that class and every class that came before. So for example, using our, our data that we used with the calculator. If this is our frequency, our cumulative frequency for the first class is 9. To get the next one, I take the, this class frequency and add what came before. 9 and 26 is 35. To get the next one, I would take 11 plus the 35 to get 46. Guys, these are the numbers that were on our calculators corresponding to the data value that was at the top of the class width. So you just add those up. An ogive is constructed by plotting a point for each class. The x-coordinate of the point is the upper class limit and the y-coordinate is the cumulative frequency. So then all points are connected with straight lines. So this is the upper class limit and then the, we start out at 0 .9999, 1.9935, 3.9946 and it's just an increasing graph. Remember I said there were 65 pieces of data that, in that table? In your cumulative frequency, the last number in the last class is your total because you're adding as you go. You're adding all these numbers up. What you should know now is how to construct the frequency and relative frequency distributions for quantitative data, how to construct and interpret histograms, know how to do them on the calculator as well. That's probably going to be more useful on the test than knowing how to do them by hand. Some possible shapes for the data include symmetric, which means normal, skewed to the right or left, unimodal, bimodal, and then in constructing and interpreting frequency polygons and ogives. And that wraps up section 2.2.